Wow, here we are in the final part of the design process for the Novice 10 transceiver. This is a double sideband transceiver for the 10 meter band, specifically uh, oriented to the novice and foundational class hams who are taking advantage of this wonderful sunspot cycle number 25 and uh, the, the DX that's possible in this band at this time. So, this part of the design process is called integration. Integration is where you bring all the various parts of your design together and you hope that they mesh together and all work together without causing trouble. You get your power going to the right stages. You look for feedback. See how things really act when they're all connected together. Integration is also called the valley of death. Uh, for engineers. It's the place where projects go wrong, fail, the money runs out, and so on. So this is always an exciting part of uh, any design uh, process. There will be another video coming up where we actually take the set into the field and attempt to make some contacts out in the woods, and I think you guys will enjoy that. But this is all about putting it all together in the box. So I just get the thing together and it's the ARRL International DX Contest Weekend. Good thing I got this DX mall to break that pile up. Whiskey United 2 Delta. Whiskey United 2 Delta, 5.9 kilowatt. 5.9 New Hampshire. Thank you, Mexico Zero, Norway Kilo Radio. Mexico India 7 Mike. Whiskey Uniform 2 Delta. Whiskey United 2 Delta. Whiskey United 2 Delta, 59K. 59 New Hampshire. Whiskey United 2 Delta, you're 59 New Hampshire. 59 New Hampshire, over. New Hampshire, guys, thanks, Echo India 7 Mike. Whiskey Uniform 2 Delta. Whiskey Uniform 2 Delta. Whiskey United 2 Delta, 59 kilowatt. You're 59 in New Hampshire. 59 New Hampshire, over. Thank you for New Hampshire, 7 So I had some questions about the uh, island pad procedure and I have a couple of tools. I have a Dremel and I have a Black & Decker Wizard. Both of them are high speed hand tools. Both a little larger than I would like to use for something like this but it's okay. I have been using the inverted cone uh, diamond style bits. Other people like to use the rotary edge type tools or you know some type of wedge point but um, this has been working okay for me and uh, you know one size fits all depends on what you're used to with these uh, with these tools but it's a small it's a very small bit and this seems to give me the flexibility to uh, cut the slots and the and the pads Okay, speaking of toroids, um, I decided on the PA rebuild, which I'm putting into the actual transceiver, that I would not use the T37. I would go down to a 20 toroid in the yellow-black. This is a 50, just for reference. And, of course, people are going to say, how are you going to fit all those turns on there? Well, they do. I fit the turns on the smaller toroid with no problems. Basically, 15 to 20 turn center tap can fit on this thing with the six turn uh, secondary. Now you might say, boy, that's a really small toroid to be winding, but I, I'll tell you, there are smaller. Uh, for instance, look at this little board that I worked on back in the late 80s, early 90s. Now those are smaller toroids. Working with a smaller power amplifier board was tricky, and I am using a different heatsink on this board. It's aluminum instead of copper. 
But when I got the PA done and bias system installed and heard all that racket on 10 meters because of the contest last weekend, I couldn't resist trying to call some of those big stations. What I failed to do was check and set the power properly and afterwards I saw I was only actually putting out 1.7 watts CW. So if you uh, go average to peak 2.66 times 1.7 watts divided by 2 because one of the sidebands is wasted my actual PEP output power uh, was only about 2.3 watts and remember I've got 150 feet of RG8 going out to a rectangle loop antenna it is up in the air pretty good though bottom feet at 10 meters okay let's review the power amplifier circuit the exciter board has a 6 dB pad at the output for stability and that uh, loss has to be made up somehow so I included a fourth class A amplifier stage back two videos ago. This gave me excess gain and allowed me to have a negative feedback drive control pot in the second stage's emitter. In this amplifier, the first three stages are all operating class A pretty heavily. The BD139 driver works well in the 29 megahertz band, in a narrow band circuit at least. This alone would probably serve okay for a half watt level type uh, amplifier if you wanted to use that for your final. But um, in this case we're driving the 2SC2078 final to its full rated output power of around 4 watts. The final amplifier operates in heavy class AB and I attempt to keep the resting collector current bias below 100 milliamp. This is accomplished with a conventional forward bias diode system that we've all seen used in those class AB RF bipolar power amp stages in schematics, literature, and so on. But you have to be careful with such a simple diode circuit. A lot depends on your heatsink practices and the thermal intimacy with the bias correcting reference diode. So you've got to get that diode very close to the output device or you can get thermal runaway. Fortunately, we key the bias, so we're basically cutting off the stage and receive. This not only saves power, it assures that thermal runaway doesn't even get a chance to occur. I found that with the second build, the stage will approach thermal runaway if you went CW key down with that test switch for about a minute. It could self-destruct readily if the bias system were not tied thermally to the plate. Short of going crazy with troubleshooting this behavior, which did upset me, the fact that we're keying the bias and the DSB being a lower duty cycle transmission, I didn't go any further. At the 2SC 2078's collector, we feed in the DC current with a choke and resistor combination. This promotes efficiency and stability. It's okay to use small wire here. It's actually a little bit beneficial to use something like number 28 or number 30 wire. I tested the choke values between 0.5 and 3 microhenries and wound the powdered iron cores with number 28 wire. Then I cap couple to a 1 to 4 transmission line transformer made of number 61 ferrite material and that brings us up to 50 ohms or close to it. The size T50 sized cores are more than capable at this power level for both the choke and for that transformer. Then I go through the relay and out to the harmonic filter. Uh, T37 or T50 size cores are even overkill really at this power level for the harmonic filter. So I'm at the point now that the linear amplifier is tested. This is the bias board which uh, basically sets the bias for the final amplifier. I'm going to sneak that in underneath here and then I'm going to stand up the power amp so that it's on spacers and this will fit just underneath it. Uh, this is kind of a 3D puzzle and this is the final step, the, the final two boards going into the transceiver. So I will be uh, mounting a speaker in the case. Cute little speaker, nice uh, 2 watt rated good magnet on it. This should nest in there okay. We'll see. And I'm getting the grill material off an old ATX power supply as usual, right? Hello. 
Not bad. Did that with the tin snips and then the uh, be a cloth and then the, the grill over that. That's a pretty good speaker for the box. Okay, so I have mounted the speaker and I cut the speaker hole out with uh, tin snips and I have glued the speaker to the bottom. Now you might wonder about gluing but I'm using this fancy Gorilla Glue and that is actually how they mounted the speaker last time uh, it was in something. So gluing the speaker. Also the grill. Here's the grill. This is just going to sit on top to protect the speaker and we'll be all set. It'll nest right in this area here on the transceiver. So I think most of you uh, should be satisfied with the final construction of the Novice 10 double sideband transceiver. That funny looking grill on top for the speaker which I've mounted inside. Let's take a peek. Okay, the little Sony 2 watt speaker that was salvaged off something. Well that funny looking grill actually came off the side of what else? An ATX power supply box. Okay, very fancy, and right? Of course we need to power the little transceiver in the field. So I have this nice uh, couple of these nice 2200 milliamp hour lithium cells. These should each be good for oh maybe four hours, five hours of operation each. Uh, these are typically used with small drones but makes a perfect uh, power source for uh, field work. Okay, okay, I get it. My come on statement that this project was aimed at the novice and foundational class, 10 meter phone activity, seems kind of silly now that the design is completed. No beginner could take on this project as a whole and expect to get a transceiver out of it without a lot of build and prototyping experience and maybe even some Elmer assistance. Certainly you could take on each piece individually just as a learning experience and breadboard it. The double sideband exciter, the linear amplifier section, and the receiver itself all turn out to be fine projects on their own. But for this design to really be practical for most folks, especially beginners, either a set of printed circuit boards or a full up kit is required probably along with a very detailed set of instructions and even test procedures. We call this the Heathkit treatment. I do plan on going that far, but in stages. So I will end this series with a short video of using the set in uh, portable fashion outdoors. Meanwhile, I'll begin the process of PWB layout and parts list work as sort of a background activity working toward a complete set of boards. I'll let you know how this progresses and how I plan on handling the boards. So I really hope that you've learned a lot about double sideband and prototyping with this uh, video series. This was a lot of fun, a big learning experience for me, and I hope it was for you also.